Funding for this edition of Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been provided by PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. Hackensack Meridian Health, keep getting better. The New Jersey Education Association. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Here when you need us most, now and always. Prudential Financial. Kane University, where cougars climb higher. And by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. My colleague, Jackie Chicarico, with me. Uh, she's the executive producer of this series called Remember Them. You see the graphic up on your screen right now. She's the executive producer and the co-host of the series. Jackie, today we're looking at the extraordinary, the incomparable, iconic Millicent Fenwick, the late Millicent Fenwick. She was a United States Congresswoman from New Jersey, ambassador to Italy. Look at that picture, Jackie, over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Did you see? Do you know the year, Jackie? That you did the interview? Yes. 1991. And yeah, she you passed were away old. just, yeah, she passed away in 1992, just the year after that. Yeah, I sat down with Millicent Fenwick and remember them, for those of you who've been watching the series, you know what Jackie and I have been doing. Really, Jackie's doing the legwork with, with our team. We're trying to remember people. We are remembering people who are connected to New Jersey in one way or another, who have made an extraordinary impact, not just on the state, but on the nation, in some cases, the world. And in Millicent Fenwick's case, case, it is the nation and the world. And I remember that interview. I went to her home, Jackie, uh, I believe in Bernardsville, and sat down with her for a long time. What did you take away from it as people are about to see that interview? Well, I'll be honest. I didn't know much about her before we started delving into this new series that we're doing, Remember Them. And, uh, you know, you let me know about this amazing interview you did with the Congresswoman back in 1991. So I went back and watched the interview. And I have to say, looking through it and listening to her, she's one of those people when she speaks, you're listening, you're hanging on to every word. You want to hear what she has to say next. And her life's journey, just not in politics, but just overall, the stories that she told you is just, it's phenomenal. Uh, where she started, where she ended it, and where she ended up, um, and all the ups and downs in between. And uh, she does talk about her relationship with uh, former Governor Tom Kane Sr. of New Jersey. And uh, they, they had they, a Jackie, they ran a, they ran a race against each other for Congress, did. I believe. It was one of the few and last civil debates and and campaigns where people may have disagreed on the issues, but they're always they, they said such, such nice things about each other. Right. And that's that's hard to see these days. Right. But she did talk about the relationship there and how they had a great relationship. And uh, I saw this quote from him that I thought really kind of summed from her Tom up. Kane about yes. Fenwick. Yes, exactly. That I wanted to read to you. And uh, he said, you couldn't invent Melissa Fenwick. She was unique. The best writers of fiction might have struggled to make her believable and they would have failed. And I think that's just a great way to sum up her, her personality, her journey, her life's work. Um, and we see that in this interview that you did with her from 1991. And to Jackie's point, <clears throat> and I maybe uh, could not make up Millicent Fenwick, but once she was there, uh, the great Gary Trudeau created the Doonesbury comic strip. And Lacey Davenport is in Look This Up. Lacey Davenport was a character based on, it was Millicent Fenwick. Did you know, Jackie, we talked about the pipe smoking. She smoked the pipe. Did you know that? <laughs> yes. Well, I didn't know that before I watched this interview. And she was a model before, every, before she even got involved in local politics. She was a single mom. Extraordinary. Jackie, we're going to be back on the back end? We are, yep. So without further ado, from 1991, wow, have I gotten old. Um, that was 1991, Millicent Fenwick. 
extraordinary woman and leader in this country, in the United States Congress. Uh, let's check her out. You said that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had a great impact on, on, on your life. Why? Well, it was the first time it ever occurred to me to think about uh, somebody in public life in this way. I, I remember it, the sh it came like a shot into my mind. My Lord, she really means it. She really means it. Means what? Means what she's saying. Someone said what Mr. Uh, Roosevelt, when he was governor of New York, pledged to uphold the law, would uh, serve martinis uh, in Hyde Park uh, before dinner. Mrs. Roosevelt would leave the room. She really meant it. And you see, that became a sort of um, benchmark for me. That was what caused me to first notice and be respectful of and eventually fond of Bella Abzug. She really meant it. You're comparing Bella Abzug, a congresswoman, former congresswoman mm. from New York, from Manhattan, with Eleanor Roosevelt? Sure. They, had, they shared the same uh, mark that I consider one of the great uh, important features in anybody connected with public life. It really to mean it, when you talk about justice and uh, a rule of law that protects every citizen equally, you ought to really mean it and be prepared to put up with some inconvenience and, and difficulty if necessary. But uh, Bella didn't care whether uh, Tip O'Neill, who would sit terribly nice, I was very fond of him, he used to call me Fenwick Darling, and I called him Speaker Darling. We got on very well. But she didn't care whether the Speaker was uh, supporting her bill or the subcommittee chairman was going to get her in trouble. She was doing what she thought her constituents needed. And I didn't agree with her. She and I didn't vote alike ever, practically. But I respected her, and I got to be very fond of her because I understood what kind of a legislator she was, do you know? Let's go back to the question of influencing mm. you. Other than Eleanor Roosevelt, who influenced you? Well, Mr. Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who said the business of government is justice. And uh, You quote him often. Often. And that's been a, an, absolute, uh, an absolute value for me. And then, you know, when I was the vice chairman of the New Jersey Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, my chairman was a wonderful man, Rabbi Chertoff of Elizabeth. And I used to call him up, sometimes very disappointed with the work that I'd done during the week not being productive. And I remember one Sunday morning when I called him, he said, but Millicent, you've got to pay attention to something that the wisdom of the elders said um, 700 years ago or something. Remember, you may never arrive at the solution you're never absolved from the responsibility of trying. And that made a tremendous impression on me because what it was saying to me was success is not the measure of a human being or of an idea's transcendence. Success, effort is the measure of the human being. How hard are you trying to do what? You said once that your father and you were very, very different. You said that you were opposites in many ways, that you were amazed that he could live his whole life and not be influenced by ideology. You also said that he was a gentleman. You said it was very different than you. You were much more political, and you called yourself, uh, you, had, you said you had a temper in a lot of ways, and that was very uh, different. Very bad temper, I regret to say, yes. Even as a very small baby, I had a very bad temper, and it's been, hard for me to learn to control it. There's no doubt about that. You? Mm-hmm. Yep. Daddy was a wonderfully gentle, lovable man, extraordinary. I remember when I first went into politics, so many people in the village here would say, you know, I was a caddy on the golf course when I was young, and your father was by far the most popular man of any of the members of the club. I mean, everybody liked him. He had a sunny, warm, understanding uh, way, hosts of friends, wherever he went. Your mother died when you were five years old mm -hmm. in a terrible accident. Well, the Lusitania. 
Let's talk about that. She died, died at sea. Well, she was determined to go to, uh, to England and France, she thought eventually. Maybe a hospital for soldiers or for people who were displaced. And the family didn't want her to, but Daddy, of course, couldn't let her go alone. She was a very headstrong person, I guess. I hardly knew her, because I was only five and three months or so when she died. But um, she insisted on going, and uh, they took the Lusitania, and of course, you know how, what happened there. You left school at 15? Yes. Why? Well, uh, my sister and I were at um, boarding school in Virginia called Foxcroft, and um, Daddy was nominated by Mr. Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge to be ambassador in Spain, which he accepted. And we left in January 1926 when I was still 15. And that was the end of what might be called formal schooling. For three months that spring, my sister and I went to a wonderful convent, absolutely adorable a convent. convent of French nuns who had lost their health in Madagascar and had been sent to Madrid to recover. And it was adorable. There was the Mother Superior, the head of the group, and these lovely nuns. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. That was the end of our formal education. Formal education. What impact, what impact did the lack of formal education have on your ultimate governing style? I don't think any. I really don't. I cannot see. Uh, maybe. Uh, People would say, well, I mean, the reason she never got anywhere with her uh, uh, home health care bills and all that kind of stuff was that she didn't have the, the uh, formal education that could have pre pre presented. Uh, uh, but my own view is that my failures were not because I didn't have formal education. There was something lacking in ego, I think. Ego? Yes. In you? Yes. How is it that someone who says she didn't have a lot of ego, possibly not a lot of confidence, how was it that you got involved in the political process? Hitler, suddenly, this extraordinary nation, brilliant in science and music and, and uh, medicine and philosophy, literate, far more literate than we were, suddenly they have Hitler. And he starts his hideous injustice. The business of government is justice. But look at his injustices. It alerted me. I was absolutely horrified. Because of Hitler? Because of Hitler. I hated the idea of all Jews of this and lumping people in groups. It was, to me, deeply offensive. You got very involved in civil rights yes. early on in your Public well, career. How? Yeah, I, how and why? Well, you know, I was interested on account of Hitler in, yeah, in uh, terrible treatment of the Jewish people and the horror of treating people in groups like that. And I joined the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And by 1951, I was on the board of the Black Self Help Group in Newark called the Leaguers. Wonderful organization. In Newark. In Newark. A, a wealthy nothing, Republican nothing to do with woman politics. from Bernardsville and in politics, interested in the politics or the life of uh, the city of Newark. Look, no, our people, our country, our system, injustice. That's what it was absolutely intolerable to me. How did I happen to get into Republican politics? Well. Uh, Riv Pine, who was our state senator, said, you're always talking about politics and Hitler, see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, why don't you get busy and do something? So he encouraged me to, to be on the, the lowest form of, of state uh, organized politics, the borough. As a member of the council, uh, I met a wonderful man, our mayor, Michael J. Nervine, great, great friend. And he taught me a lot. How did the state legislature come up? Michael J. Nervine wrote to our county chairman, Republican chairman, and said, you ought to run Millicent for a countywide office, freeholder or assembly. And Had you been thinking about running for no. high office? I didn't know he was thinking about it. Is that where we go back to the question of ego? or 
I don't know. You see, I think it's a hand of the good Lord. You'll run, you agree to run for the state legislature in yeah. 1969. Right. You get elected. Yeah. You're in the minority party. Yeah. Governor Cahill is the governor. Yeah. What was it that you remember about your legislative career? What stands out? I remember a feeling, of course, uh, a little bit, well, where are the women around here? <laughs> you know what I mean. But, uh, and there was a very big bill. This was my first moment of triumph. There was a big bill which was going to change the labor laws. Women were prohibited by law from working between midnight and 8 a.m., although it was the highest paid shift at the time. And I had consulted my friends in the NAACP and in Focus and Aspira, the, uh, what we, and I had telegrams from the heads of those uh, local New Jersey organizations in favor of changing this to allow women to work between 12 midnight and and of course the boys were awfully against it the other assemblymen and yes and many of the organizations I think most of the labor organizations were against it and they said how do we uh, say that they can go risk the streets uh, to go at uh, uh, 1130 for their 12 o'clock shift I said, are you there to take them home at midnight when they finish their 8 to 12 shift, uh, 4 to, uh, to midnight shift? And then one of them said, and how can you speak uh, uh, for, on behalf of uh, all this women in industry when you've never been in, worked in a factory yourself? And I said, I have not disqualified you because you've never been a woman. <laughs> And it was marvelous. I was terrified because the whole room burst into laughter and clapping and all this. And it was on the front page of the paper the next day. And uh, I was terrified. I thought that I'm going to have an enemy for life. Not at all. He rushed up to me and he said, uh, I just want to tell you that thanks to you the other day, what you said, I'm on the front page of the Newark Evening News for the first time in my life. <laughs> During your career in the state assembly, there was a floor debate mm -hmm. on an equal rights amendment, some mm -hmm. version of it. One of your male colleagues got up and started talking about oh, women. He was, he was adorable. I'll never forget. He was at the opposite side of the chamber. But he stood up and he, his hands were gripped like this together. And you could see the knuckles were white. He, he, was, he was talking from the heart. And he said, you know, I, I just don't like this. I don't like this bill. I, I'll tell you why. I've always thought about women as being kissable and cuddly and smelling good. <laughs> well, it was an absolute shock. And I didn't know how to kind of bring it down from this passionate level and bring it to sort of less. And of course, the only answer to that kind of thing is, I've always felt that way about men. I only hope you haven't been disappointed as often as I have. <laughs> But I mean, so you got up and said you that. See, you, yes, but you see, the, the, the thing is, a little common sense kind of to bring a little, bring us down to earth a little bit in, in all of this uh, hierarchy. Because the truth is, you see, that if we had women in positions of power like men, there would be the same proportion of corruption and, and ego drive and all of it. Women would not govern differently no, than men? No, certainly not. It's 1974. Mm -hmm. You are serving as the uh, head of the Consumer Affairs Division here in the state of New Jersey. Right. What motivated you to run for the United States Congress at 64 years of age? It's the same old thing, like the running for, for uh, the legislature. It, it, somebody else suggests it. I was in Trenton and saw a friend of mine, a, a journalist. I think his name was John Davies. A reporter for the Camden paper. And he said to me, you know, Millicent, you better look at my um, column tomorrow. And so I thought, that's interesting. I wonder what he's going to say. And I got the paper and read it with great care. It said that uh, Peter Freelingheisen, who had been representing the 5th Congressional District for 22 years, was, not, was thinking of not running again. And Everybody was talking about Millicent Fenwick running. But you weren't thinking about it. Never heard of such a thing. I didn't know Peter wasn't going to run. I didn't know any of these things. I never thought of running for Congress. I was perfectly happy in my district 
representing Somerset County in Trenton. In fact, I have a picture of me taken in the legislature, and I think it's the happiest day in my life. I couldn't believe that I had been sent by my fellow citizens to represent them in the State House. You weren't thinking about Washington. Never imagined such a thing. So you get talked about in this column. Yeah. Everyone else starts talking about Millicent exactly. Fenwick running for Congress, and you get swept up into yeah. it. And I left the consumer director position April 4th in order to be legal, qualify legally for the primary in which Tom Kane and I had a very pleasant fight. Let's talk about this Tom Kane yeah. fight and, uh, with Millicent. Tom Cameron. was so nice. He was a know. young assemblyman. He was speaker. He was speaker of the House. And young and, and awfully nice and a friend. And a Republican and the, primary. Yeah. And the Friday before the election, we met, and I turned to him, and I said, look here, Tom, this is the kind of primary that, that ought to be held all the time. Clean. We didn't fight each other uh, personally. We had some differences. I think I wanted Nixon to be impeached, and he didn't, but that was the only thing I can think of as a difference of issues, really, profoundly. And you won by 83 votes. Was it that? Yes. And uh, I, uh, we embraced in the parking lot under the lab, and I said, if you win, uh, which you probably will uh, next Tuesday, count on me. I'll be quiet if you don't want me to speak. I'll speak if you want speeches. I'll contribute time or uh, a support, because this is really the way politics ought to be. When you got elected to Congress, uh, Richard Nixon was a big issue. Give me your feelings about Nixon at the time. Well, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure I was right now that I look back, and maybe it would have shaken our country too, too deeply, but I thought he ought to be impeached. Um, he should have been impeached, because Mr. Ford uh, took over when he resigned, you know, when Nixon resigned. I was terribly disappointed uh, that um, this would happen uh, with a Republican president. It was embarrassing to the party. Oh, it was more than embarrassing. It was a terrible blow. And I felt awfully badly about it. And I thought that it would be an example to the country that no matter how powerful you are, you can be impeached. Mm. Another name, another former president, Ronald Reagan. He liked people, and he was eminently self-respecting. For instance, when they told him that um, when he was going to, to Ireland, there would be all these demonstrations, um, and didn't he feel badly about that against him? And he laughed. He said, not at all. He said, they're just trying to make me feel at home. I haven't been around this country in two years without a demonstration. You see, I think that someone with less uh, self-respect and self-confidence would have said, well, people who aren't very intelligent always do these. You see what I mean? What didn't you like about Ronald Reagan? Well, what I didn't like about Ronald Reagan was the quality of some of the people that seemed he seemed to feel were perfectly okay around him. Mm. George Bush. How do you feel about George Bush? I like him. The other day I was so touched and he was so right. This problem with Neil Bush, his son. And you could see the agony in his face. He said, of course, as a father, I am naturally distressed. I'm sure all of you understand that. But I believe in the honor and integrity of my son. As president, the situ system will work as it should, and it will, he will fall into its effects as he may. Now, that is proper. You see what I mean? I thought, bravo, Bush. <laughs> Jim Florio. You served with Jim Florio yes, in did. Congress. Yeah. Now he's governor. Uh, what's your sense of Florio? Well, he may do some very fine things, and I'm certain they wouldn't criticize without study. But he's very, in my books, macho. Macho? Hmm. I think that's that he enjoys uh, authority. Trenchant. Interesting. Mm. Um, Doonesbury. How did the Doonesbury character, um, Lacey Down? I have no idea. It was fascinating. Telephone rang one day, one of my friends in the press, 
how do you like being in the comics? I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, you're Lacey Davenport in Doomsbury. Well, I said, let me look into it. And there was one uh, cartoon I terribly wanted to buy. It showed this ridiculous, hideous Lacey Davenport with her glasses and peering down at a little black uh, man in a group of people on strike, carrying placards on strike. And they see Dad Pop was saying, you poor dears, that's perfectly terrible. And I thought, my God, where has this man heard me speak? <laughs> so like, I was horrified. You got it right. Oh, of course. I was horrified and amused, and I would have loved to have bought that. But I thought, if I get in touch with him, will he think that I'm trying to encourage him or stop him? So you never did? No. How are you, dear? The 1982 U.S. Senate campaign. Everyone said you were a winner. You were 20 points ahead. You were running against uh, Frank Lautenberg. Mm -hmm. People didn't know him. What happened? I don't know. I don't know. The next morning when I woke up, I thought it can't be. And Thursday morning I woke up and I said to myself, thank God I did. I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to worry about what happened or why. It has happened. And uh, I'm not going to, cons everything is in the hands of the Lord. And I believe that, you see. To see more Remember Them programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. So there you have it, um, Millicent Femick. And I'll tell you something interesting, Jackie. I don't know if you've seen this. Back in the day when newspapers were even more important, you can't tell from here. This is an article from uh, the Star-Ledger, March 20th, 1991. You can't, never mind, you can't see it through the glass. But I remember it was one of the first reviews that were ever uh, done on a program that we did. And I will tell you, the reason we got such a great review was because of Millicent Fenwick. She was fascinating. How about the stuff she talked about in terms of Hitler, that Hitler influenced her to get involved in politics, what she saw going on in Germany? Um, she was a big advocate of civil rights, human rights. Did right. you take that away? Oh, yes, yes, for sure. And when I listened to that part of your conversation with her, it made me think about what would she think today with what is going on in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine? Um, you know, just thinking what her perspective would be today. And I could see her getting even more involved uh, than she ever has before because of the terrible, horrific war going on in Ukraine right now. I do wonder, uh, and again, Matt, Jackie and I are not doing political commentary or analysis, but I'll say this. Given how progressive Millicent Fenwick was, a Republican, she was progressive. I'm not even going to use the word liberal, but she was very much involved in the civil rights movement. She was involved in Newark, um, very concerned about the experience of African Americans uh, at the time that got her very involved. Where would be the place for a Millicent Fenwick in, quote, the Republican Party today? I'm not sure there would be know. a place. I don't know. Say that again? I don't, I'm not sure there would be a place for her today. Uh, what do you think? It's, it's hard to imagine that in today's political world. I think it'd be incredibly challenging. And it would also be fascinating to hear what Millicent Fenwick would have had to say about January 6th, about people believing that Joe Biden is not the legally elected president, particularly 60, 70, 80 percent of Republicans and Donald Trump. But we'll never know. But we have to remember Millicent Fenwick, and she's part of our Remember Them series. So, Jackie, to you and the team uh, on behind Remember Them, thank you so much for doing this. Great job. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. That's Jackie. I'm Steve. This is Remember, Remember Them. I'll get it out. We'll see you next time. Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSENG, NJM Insurance Group, Hackensack Meridian Health, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Prudential Financial, Kane University, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe, and by New Jersey Monthly. Today's forecast is brought to you by... We are the tippy top, we're top insurance.
Some insurance companies are known for their jingles. Top insurance, please hold. NJM is known for what matters. Outstanding service you can actually count on. No jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM, get a quote today.